Yeah, go ahead. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shalini Nayar, and she's coming via virtuality here. And uh, she's going to talk about palliative care and mental health. Dr. Nayer is currently practicing as both a respirologist and a palliative medicine specialist in British Columbia at the Surrey Memorial Hospital site and the BC Cancer Agency. She attended McMaster University for her internal medicine training and subsequently completed the respirology fellowship at the University of British Columbia, as well as the palliative medicine training program. Dr. Nair is currently functioning in the capacity of local department head, acute palliative care program for Surrey Acute, and is a clinical assistant professor with the UBC Department of Medicine. Her interests, presentations, and publications have focused on the importance of palliative care and interventions in both malignant and non-malignant disease. Hopefully I captured that correctly for you, Dr. Nair. It's a mouthful. Thank you so much. So thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's a little tragic that I can't be there in person. I love this conference and to see people. So um, I'm going to share my screen to start my presentation. Um, so um, I've been tasked with a large topic today that I think is very important and that is looking at palliative care but also focusing a bit on mental health which can you know sort of suffer with any chronic illness throughout any trajectory and there is some evidence that is specifically allocated to pulmonary fibrosis so what i'm hoping to do is to review components that that factor into mental health and to factor into what our risk factors are to discuss what the current issues are and understand the role overall of advanced care planning and palliative care in pulmonary fibrosis. And I will try to encapsulate that in 30 minutes. <laughs> so we'll see how far we get, but hoping to answer any questions about it at the end as well. So for those who are unfamiliar, and some of you I will have met before and may be very familiar, when we are speaking about palliative care, we're talking about an approach that improves quality of life for patients, period. And those are in patients who are facing a potential life-threatening illness. The focus will always be on relieving suffering. And what we're going to show a little bit today is that suffering comes in many forms. It can come in physical suffering and also manifest in psychological suffering. So pain has many forms, but it can also come in the form of existential and spiritual suffering as well, which hopefully is recognized by our group. Previously, and I think sometimes even now, when we talk about illnesses that have disease modifying therapies available to them, we talk about cure or life prolongation and at some point we shift and we say, well, now, now we can't do anything, so let's switch over only to symptom control. That seems to be a bit um, too, too siloed into various. So instead, what we hope to choose to do is to say that pain and symptom management, regardless of what that looks like, even though those symptoms are different for everybody, should really be steadily throughout the trajectory of any person's illness. And then there are survivorship issues and bereavement that also need to be added to that full circle to encompass what an actual illness looks like. We know that palliative care is talked a lot about in the context of cancer related illnesses. I think that's probably because in cancer-related illnesses, prognosis is firm a lot of the time. Treatments are firm, their tumors are measurable, their decline or their improvement is very obvious to scale and it's really been looked at. But in those patients, we've shown that the addition of pain and symptom management can improve multiple quality of life and even life prolonging factors in very many patients. So the second step, was to look at it in patients that have non-cancer disease, we call non-malignant illnesses. 
And lo and behold, we found that it's actually helpful for them too. And luckily, we've had some growth in studies that look particularly not only at lung disease as a whole, but pulmonary fibrosis particularly, which, which is absolutely amazing. So it's less integrated. But over the last 10 years, it's really sort of taken off because I think that patient reported questionnaires have really taken off. And so people are wanting to talk about it, which makes it a lot easier to study in groups. So there's been several studies looking at health related quality of life and a few themes do emerge and reduced quality of life for various reasons overall may be present. But that we know and you may know that the dealing with breathlessness is exhausting but also that pain and mental health issues like depression and anxiety are present at high, high levels in people who have chronic lung disease. We look at lung cancer as being one of the hardest cancers to deal with psychologically. And in a single study, they found that sometimes quality of life can be even lower in patients that live a long time as opposed to patients with metastatic lung cancer. We know that patients, um, people come to see us and talk to us about their medical issues and may be in a more vulnerable state and may not share with us the things that are bothering them psychologically, but their overall disease may suffer and their care may suffer if we don't identify those things so that patients feel like they may be at the mercy to us when they come and they see us that we're not going to give them medical interventions if they're you know not feeling as good mental clarity as usual um most treatments that we have are non-curative they prolong life but they can't cure an illness so of course over the time over the trajectory of someone's life um a lot of stressful interactions happen as well in pulmonary fibrosis, the physical factors that lead to people feeling more symptoms are obvious. We can measure them. So we have the ability to measure a lot. We can measure level of breathlessness on multiple scales. We can look at the diffusion capacity on someone's lung function test, those breathing tests that you're doing like every six months or so. We can look at the extent of scarring that we physically see on the CT scan. Is it worse? And we can look at whether someone's developing problems with their oxygen while they're walking or if those oxygen requirements start to increase. And also looking at the presence of pulmonary hypertension or elevated right heart pressures over time. And then there's the longitudinal factors. Even though we may not see changes on CT scan, you may feel more breathless. It makes sense because the CT scan can't pick up everything or every small micro change. We can measure a decreased vital capacity. We can say this looks like it's progressed. And we can also see that the diffusion capacity may change by its absolute value. So we are measuring things. And when we're looking at those numbers, we're not just looking at the numbers to say, let's still qualify for an intetinib or perfenidone. We're also looking at the numbers to say, hey, can we prepare ourselves for any worsening? Or can we say with certainty, hey, no, look, this looks great. Things are really, really stable. That's impactful for you to hear. So when we look at the actual studies, what do we see? So um, there are themes that arise. There's eight of the largest studies. There are many, many small studies, and there's many, many studies that are ongoing. A lot of them rely on um, questionnaires or patient-reported symptoms or their caregivers, which I think are really important and not just looking at which you know drugs make people feel better. Um, but the three major themes that are impactful to me and my practice and in, in the people that I meet are firstly the low level of social functioning, which can be greatly impactful to people who are used to being very, very social. And the reason for that, it's a multitude of reasons actually, but one of them is that it's just hard when you're carrying your oxygen, when you're already tired, if you have side effects from your medication, or if you're grappling with a new diagnosis, it's hard to get out and see people as you normally would. 
intense breathlessness generally within the last year of life but can be longitudinally present as well and that intense breathlessness leads to lower mobility so able to functionally even try to do things less and inadequate supports in advanced disease so not all of us are blessed with a village i think it is amazing when people do have a village and we should always take advantage of that but that inadequate supports if you don't have the finances to to pay for extra supports part of the role of the palliative care program is to help fill in and identify people who are vulnerable to um, having inadequate supports in their advanced disease part of those studies looked at care concerns that were particularly important to pulmonary fibrosis patients and this one study in the journal of palliative medicine interviewed 18 um, patients and their caregivers with the aim of identifying where where the gaps are, where can specialists help? The themes that, that people who are living with pulmonary fibrosis brought up, and some of these may or may not be relevant to everybody, you know, that's there today, but, but really a lot of anger and frustration because we are taking a people, right? A group of people that are functional, independent, have lived their own lives for so long and are now being constrained by how unwell they feel. And so that that was a, a major theme, the rumination on frustration, uncontrolled symptoms of dyspnea without treatment, the inability to sleep well, and that may be a combination of mental health issues that we'll get to in a minute. Cough seems to be a large theme in um, suffering with symptoms of pulmonary fibrosis and then and then the familial strain, everybody else's frustration or worry about you. Um, the caregivers were feeling a bit inept in dealing with familial strain on their own because they're in it, right? And felt that maybe the care teams were not as open about disease trajectory. Where Where is my loved one at? Are they very, very sick? Are we at risk of losing them in a year? Or can I be comfortable for the next five, right? Where are we in this trajectory of illness? And then the healthcare professionals had concerns too. They also felt that they didn't have the tools all the time and it's so selective and based on people's training and why we do these educational forums, right? Um, they felt that they didn't have the tools or understanding about how to manage the symptoms or what would work, what was dangerous, how quickly to go up on medications that we use to help treat some of these symptoms. And oftentimes, unshockingly we underestimate the psychological needs of patients and i would say that is so true for lung disease and probably true for a multitude of illnesses even outside of lung disease but even if we just look at the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease the scarring patterns that people develop you know so much time and rightfully so is spent on uh, investigations, diagnosis, what are my treatments, what sorts of interventions can be done to help me improve that we forget to ask, hey, how are you doing with all of that new information, right? So looking at the mental health piece specifically, we know that quality of life in pulmonary fibrosis is really exacerbated by having comorbidity. So having symptoms of suffering at all. The most common ones may be associated with a new diagnosis of cancer, if that happens, reflux disease, the presence of pulmonary hypertension or other age-related comorbidities that we gather, osteoporosis, for instance, that may cause us to be careful in our lives or decrease our mobility. It's also affected by side effects of medications. So I know that we have medications, anti-fibroblastic medications now that are very helpful, but some people simply can't tolerate them. And some people need additional medications to help, uh, to help them take their um, baseline medication. So we need to address those things because they can cause depression and anxiety as well, if unable to be treated properly. There have been multiple studies done on pulmonary fibrosis and meta-analyses done relating to anxiety and depression in particular. 
about one third, if I take all of those studies together and I look at the majority of their data, show that patients may experience anxiety just by having a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. This is looking at patients who are at multiple sites of disease trajectory or severity, and about 50% may experience depression. Those numbers are actually astronomical. They are very, very high, and there are very, very high rates of people that may be suffering thinking that they're alone. The answer to that is absolutely not. It's more common than you think. In fact, if we look at the comorbidities generally associated with pulmonary fibrosis, depression um, rates right in the middle. And that is rated a little less because I think people will self-report physical symptoms first. And of course they should, right? Because those are ones that they need immediate help with a lot of the time, but um, it's not insignificant at all. It's about what we said about a 50% mark. There are many other contributing factors for depression and anxiety. When you look in the subgroup analysis of those studies that are done, and many contributing factors really have to do not only with advanced pulmonary fibrosis, but in um, any change in trajectory. So if you're coasting along really well and then get a series of exacerbations or hospitalizations or even an intensive care unit visit, that change from your stability, you know, may trigger you to feel anxious or depressed about it. Social isolation, as mentioned earlier, so um, not joining support groups, not seeing your friends or family as often, or not telling people that, you know, you really need to see them when you need to see them. Those are, that's an important thing to recognize. Looking at treatment in and of itself, you know, the big question that I, I was looking for before this forum when I was reviewing some of the evidence and literature is, does treatment actually affect anxiety and depression, i.e. the absolute treatment and tetanide, profenadone, do they cause improvement in mental health as well? Um, turns out people are actually asking that same question. They use it as a, it's mixed up in the health-related quality of life questionnaire, but um, there's emerging evidence that it probably actually does show lower rates of anxiety and depression, but you know those studies right now are very underrepresented. Secondary conditions may develop while you're living with lung disease because some of us will develop lung disease at a more advanced age. And if another cognitive problem happens like dementia, that may also destabilize somebody's mental health. And then the other things that come with it, which I find are the least likely to be discussed. And one of them is finances. So being sick is not cheap. It's also not free. You have to drive to your doctor's appointments, pay for parking, pay for any medications that are not covered that may deal with side effects, um, pay for private caregivers or a ride. These are finances that there is not a whole lot of relief um, Four. And then the last one is burden of care. People who have to worry more about either being a burden or their on their family or finding people to help care for them they are more likely to experience depression and anxiety in association with pulmonary fibrosis. That burden of symptoms generally, if I go back to the, the study by the Bajwa group in London, do look at shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and chest pain. That burden of symptoms that people have that need to be physically treated will also contribute greatly to mental health uh, problems. And if you look at the, the treatment area just at the bottom there of that slide, um, a lot of people's multitude of symptoms, so if they had opiate therapy or benzodiazepine therapy, and, and I don't mean like we just start put, giving people medications, but if they qualified for that therapy medically, um, they unanimously felt benefit, even when treated with the medications for a short while. And the patients that never got treated continued to feel worse. 
So what are the things that we can do to recognize that we have um, this prevalence of mental health issues that are possible for us? So one of the things that's been found to be really helpful is talking about it. So saying, I know I need to do things like advanced care planning if I'm sick or things are changing for me. And there is a tool called My Voice in British Columbia that can be done online, or you can order a physical copy of the book and fill out that goes through goals, representation, the things that you're worried about, fears and anxiety, and helps you sort through what your decision-making process can be for these things. Also bringing up advanced care planning and mental health issues with your family or your doctor. Um, Some of advanced care planning may include needing a team, needing that village, needing to talk to a palliative care team as well. Communication with loved ones. So we need to be letting the people that are close to us know, hey, lately I've not been feeling right. And that may trigger somebody to also help you to express that to a healthcare professional in your vicinity. Joining support groups, and I probably don't need to tell this group how important it is to attach yourselves to other caregivers and other people who are living through the same thing, who can help troubleshoot ways that their lives were made easier or things that they recognize that weren't quite right. You might even meet someone that's had one of these associated mental health issues with their illness and help you sort of decide what type of um, intervention you need. Pulmonary rehabilitation, the course, which again, I'm preaching to the choir, but um, has shown excellent um, reduction in anxiety, depression, specifically in pulmonary fibrosis. So there are some people that kind of feel like they're not up to it, like I'm not physically up to it, I don't feel like I want to get out. If you're trying to triage, right, where you should be spending your energy or time, if you're feeling down, pulmonary rehabilitation has very good, very good evidence that it's probably worth it to try to go. And then there's the treatment portion for people who have severe need for medications, pharmacological treatments. Of course, it's very important to recognize that if you are worried about it on any level, you or your cared one, then it is important to seek a professional opinion from your GP, from a counselor, psychologist, or psychiatrist if it's necessary. And one of your primary health care providers may recommend that. So this, and and this, I'm happy for my slides to be shared because I think, you know, I, I found that this put together a really nice compilation at the bottom there. It's minor depressive and anxiety symptoms, and it sort of increases by the severity. And it starts kind of how we said. So if you go to the bottom left, time limited minor symptoms, assessment, support, education, active monitoring, but that involves saying it out loud recognizing that you're having these issues or having a loved one say, I've noticed that you're not feeling as well. Do, do you actually feel that way? And open up and, and be able to talk about it. And then it's, it sort of goes up to there until the, mo- the more severe symptoms, which you know, you've know you tried the, the things below and, and maybe you do need medication. And you know I'll tell you that um, there is great evidence that people who have clinical depression or clinical anxiety do really well in a very carefully selected population of people who need it. They respond incredibly well to psychological interventions like medications if they need them. When we talk about your village and we talk about the palliative care group, Your village, your palliative care group who can be involved in your care either by referral by your primary health care practitioner or nurse um, does have presence in the community with a home care team in formal palliative care units and hospitals. They have a presence in residential care like long term care in a consultation service in the hospital to support your primary team members and in hospice care and hospice care is a place where people go to live generally in the last few months of life if they need 24-hour round-the-clock care or have symptoms that would benefit from daily interaction with the team and doctor. 
To access a lot of that village, there is a program in British Columbia that many of you may already be aware of called the BC Palliative Benefits Program. It is literally a sheet of paper, very easy to sign. All it is is recognition that a person has a significant illness and will need this help. Um, it doesn't mean that the person who fills this out on your behalf thinks that you're actively passing away. Um, it just means that we're recognizing you need this village and you need all the support that comes with it. On the form, right, it says um, generally in the last six months of life. If that is not entirely possible or applicable to patients with advanced lung disease, because prognostication is so very uncertain. As you know, so much depends on the medications we're taking, tolerating the medications we're taking, infections, vaccinations, reactions, and other comorbidities that we develop. So I think if we think somebody's just sick for lung disease, we sign them up for this program. It's literally dictated by functional status and need. If you need it and you're not functioning as well, this is how the program benefits work. It allows you access to the community health team we have available, to equipment in the home if you need it, and to admission to see palliative care doctors if necessary, as well as medication coverage for medications that are used by our team, plus many, many others. Um, any healthcare practitioner can fill this out for you. I wanted to also bring up just a note on treatments. So um, when you do meet a health care team, um, they will suggest multiple medications for you that may be helpful that you don't have to take, but that maybe could be trialed, right? And I just wouldn't want you to be surprised that they do use painkillers sometimes to help with breathlessness and pain and that we do and are very comfortable with understanding the use of anxiety medication, depression medication, and social support uh, systems. We're very well versed in using sleep agents and anti nauseants for all those side effects. We're very well versed in screening for constipation and dealing with those side effects if they happen from some of the medications that we prescribe. These are evidence-based treatments. So they're not um, guesstimations anymore. Palliative medicine has done a lot of particular studies on advanced lung disease, and I would encourage any of you to look them up to see you know, what kind of interventions should be available to you because we'll always review your goals of care. I think all healthcare practitioners should, and I think you should. You know, I think all of us should, no, no matter what. Um, but we'll always start with the lowest level of intervention that is life-saving or life-changing for you. So, you know, in summary, we know that depression and anxiety are present in very high numbers in patients with advanced lung disease. We also know that treatment depends on early recognition and direct care. We also know that we should be doing a few more studies to see, listen, you know, we're, we're doing all these fabulous studies on antifibrotics, right? And so much of it is telling us about lung condition and functional capacity and health-related quality of life. But focusing on just the mental health subgroup it would also be helpful to know if that's a reason that would prompt somebody to use those medications more often. Palliative care is available to you to support you during an advanced disease trajectory, and it is accessible to you in the community. So you should take advantage of that if you need it. Um, and just the recognition that if you do, you know, treating physical symptoms does improve overall burden of mental health in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And, you know, I thank you guys for, for listening, and I'd be happy to field any questions that uh, the group has for me. Hi, my question is, um, I, I, we hear a lot of talk around clinical anxiety and clinical depression, and I wonder why we don't use language of grief. Why, don't, why we don't talk about grief and the fact that there is loss being experienced by both the patients and their caregivers through the process of the trajectory of this disease. 
oftentimes when we get into these places where people are deep in anxiety or depression, they have a discomfort in speaking about that openly. But if we had an opportunity to more openly just acknowledge the fact that what we're experiencing is loss, the patient is experiencing loss on the daily with respect to their level of independence and functioning, their socialization, their ability to socialize, their, their reliance on others. There's a loss associated with that. Grief is not just about when people die, right? And so, but we use these bigger, more clinical language that sort of discounts the fact and even allows us to acknowledge the fact that the loss is occurring and people are feeling it. It's grief. It sometimes isn't deep depression, it's grief. And so, you know, there's so many multitudes of ways that people can deal with that, but we don't use that language. And so I'm curious about that. You know, that's, that, that's an excellent point. And you're so, I mean, I can't even say you're so completely right. There's, I don't have the, I'm, you obviously are, right? You're speaking from experience. There's no way you're not. Um, first and foremost, I think what you're identifying is truth. I've heard so many people say that to me, actually, right? That I, I feel sad, right? Grief, that I'm losing these things. And I think what your what your point is really showing is how how much we should actually listen, actually, right? Because you you just told me that, and I'm so happy that you did, and I will absolutely take that to heart. And I think all of us should, when we speak to our patients, acknowledge that. Um, but also, we should listen to you. And when we ask you how you feel, and you say grief, we should acknowledge that. So I appreciate you telling me that. You're right. We go. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Shalini.